Within the Star Wars universe, we will tend to have a group that we identify with, a group that we'd like to think we'd be part of if given the chance, be it the Jedi, Sith, Rebels, or in this case the Bounty Hunters. We're first introduced to the Bounty Hunters in the original trilogy, and they don't seem to do them much justice, as Boba Fett and the other Bounty Hunters have very limited screen time. When we finally get to see Boba Fett in action in Return of the Jedi, during the fight scene outside of Jabba's palace, a half-blind Han Solo stumbling around manages to cause his jet back to malfunction, leading him to almost comically fall into the Sarlacc pit. Despite only having a total of 27 words spoken, and just over 6 minutes of screen time, Boba Fett became a fan favourite, which strikes me as rather odd, because besides looking like a cool character, the movies present him as nothing more than a hired gun. The character's popularity continued to grow, and over the years there have been several talks about a standalone Boba Fett movie. We can assume that this may have had some influence on Lucas when giving Jango Fett a much larger role in the Clone Wars. Ultimately one can argue that Boba Fett is one of the main reasons that bounty hunters are explored in the extended universe. They quickly earned the reputation as some of the galaxy's most dangerous individuals, and they were known for their ability to hunt down and assassinate Jedi and Sith. We do see this to a certain extent in the prequels, when Jango Fett goes toe-to-toe -to -toe with Obi-Wan and doesn't look too far out of place. When we see the Jedi and Sith in combat, they often brush off any non-force sensitive foe with ease, but with the bounty hunters, that isn't quite the case. One of the main reasons that the bounty hunters were able to cause such a problem for the Jedi and the Sith was the vast array of tools and weapons available to them. The weapons that are most commonly associated with bounty hunters are their blaster pistols. Despite them being small and compact, they possessed impressive stopping power, and with multiple attachments that allowed for noise reduction, they were a popular choice amongst assassins. The arsenal of the Bounty Hunters also included stun darts to immobilise targets, as well as toxic darts for discreet kills. There are weapons they used that completely disregarded the element of surprise, including wrist rockets, grenades, cluster missiles and flamethrowers. These weapons were all capable of doing massive damage, and they were quite often used by Bounty Hunters when they wanted to quickly escape or finish a job. It was pretty difficult for anyone who had a bounty on their head to ever assume that they were really safe as the Bounty Hunter's jetpack and built-in cutting torch made it possible for them to reach areas that may not be accessible to most. Many of the weapons and gadgets that we've just mentioned are reasons why the Bounty Hunters were such formidable foes for the Sith and the Jedi, but they always had one or two additional tricks at their disposal. The whipcord was used to entangle bounties that would need to be captured but returned alive. We see Jango use the whipcord quite effectively during his confrontation with Obi-Wan, making it much harder for the Jedi to use his lightsaber. Given their line of work, it's inevitable that bounty hunters would be involved in close combat, which is why many of them carried vibroblades, allowing them to cut down enemies in close proximity while being able to fend off the attacks of a lightsaber. It's impossible to discuss the weapons and the equipment of the bounty hunters without mentioning their iconic armour. A lot of people have speculated what the armour is made of over the years, and there are some theories that make very valid arguments. Armour similar to that of Jango and Boba Fett's is most likely made of Durasteel, the same metal that was used to construct the armour of Darth Vader. Durasteel is quite robust and fares well versus blaster fire, however it's unlikely that the armour offers much protection against any heavy form of weaponry and even lightsabers. Durasteel being quite clunky, which suggests that some kind of padding or leather hide may be worn underneath to help with any chafing and increase mobility. The problem of mobility and flexibility is still of course an issue with this kind of armour, which is why we see many bounty hunters ditch the heavy suit in favour for light armour or even just regular clothing. There are definitely pros to this light armour approach, not standing out being one of them. The sight of a fully suited up mercenary is likely to spook most potential targets, making the light armour approach and plain clothing options much more viable for discreet jobs. Being able to pass themselves off as a civilian or common smuggler, along with the added mobility, is clearly something that some bounty hunters value over the added protection of a full suit of armour. One of the things that I enjoy most about the bounty hunters is that they're essentially this motley group of mercenaries made up of individuals all throughout the universe. There are certain races that have become pretty well associated with the Bounty Hunters, such as the Mandalorians, who are already considered some of the fiercest warriors in the galaxy. 
That coupled with their skills in combat, their constant search for glory, and their neutrality in most conflicts that did not involve them, made them almost perfect bounty hunters. Anyone could essentially become a bounty hunter, ranging from human to any alien race you can think of. There are even tales of an assassin droid who went by the name of IG-88, who quickly became one of the most infamous bounty hunters in the galaxy. Some of you may recognise the droid, as IG-88 made an appearance in The Empire Strikes Back, before appearing in a host of comics as one of Darth Vader's preferred mercenaries. Now this video wouldn't really be complete without us taking a look at some of the most influential and notorious bounty hunters in the Star Wars universe. I think one of the coolest characters to come from the Clone Wars TV show and the Marvel Star Wars comic series is Cad Bane. His appearance looks straight out of a spaghetti western, as Bane was known for wearing a wide brimmed hat and wielding a pair of blaster pistols which really gave him that gunslinger vibe. After a confrontation with a Sith, a prolonged force choke left Cad Bane requiring breathing tubes to survive. Unlike most bounty hunters, Cad Bane did not use a jetpack, but he preferred the use of rocket boots when it came to keeping up with the Sith and the Jedi. He was considered the most feared and notorious bounty hunter in the galaxy, and many have theorised that he had a hand in training a young Boba Fett. The adventures of Cad Bane are numerous, and they deserve their own video, but there are a few worth mentioning. During the Clone Wars, Cad Bane was captured by the Republic and taken to a detention centre in Coruscant. We then find out that Cad Bane had been hired by Moralo Ival, a crime boss working for Count Dooku. Bane had allowed himself to be captured, to gain access to the prison that Ival was located in. He paid several inmates to stage a prison riot, and in the commotion, with the help from a disguised Obi-Wan, Bane, Ival and Kenobi were able to escape the prison. Bane also took part in one of the most dangerous tournaments in history. The winners of the tournament on Sereno were given the job of kidnapping Chancellor Palpatine, the tournament itself featured the best bounty hunters in the galaxy, and the last five stand-in after a series of tasks would be victorious. To no surprise, Cad Bane was amongst the survivors, and as a result he would later lead the mission to capture Palpatine. Over the years, Bane had numerous altercations with Obi-Wan and Anakin, and after finding out that Obi-Wan had tricked him while in disguise, he swore vengeance upon the Jedi. In Asajj Ventress, we have one of the most unique bounty hunters, it's uncommon to see a force sensitive bounty hunter, but after being betrayed by her master Dooku, who attempted to have her killed, she had lost all sense of direction and was forced into exile. She eventually joined Boba Fett and his crew for a simple escort mission. Upon discovering that the cargo was a young woman being used as ransom, Ventress began to sympathise, but she still had every intention in making the delivery. That is until Boba Fett revealed how small her cut of the job was compared to the rest. She then turned on the bounty hunter, force choking him and leaving him tied and gagged in the box that once held their hostage. She delivered the cargo and collected the credits with the client not knowing that the cargo box contained Boba Fett and not the young girl. She then returned the girl safely, collecting an additional sum of credits as a reward. Ventress then returned to Boba Fett's crew, splitting the credits evenly between them, even leaving Fett's money with Bosk, another bounty hunter you may recognise from the original trilogy. Ventress gives us quite an interesting character, a slave who became a Jedi and eventually a Sith. She's an extremely capable bounty hunter, and one of the best trackers of all time, but unlike most bounty hunters, she has a conscience which conflicts with her job. Despite this making her job a little bit more difficult, she continued working as a bounty hunter, where she would eventually meet Quinlan Vos, a maverick or grey Jedi turned bounty hunter himself. The book Dark Disciple chronicles the adventures of the two for those of you who are interested, there are some honourable mentions of course. Black Chrysanthemum, the famous Wookiee bounty hunter, was known for his work with the Hutt Cartel. The scar on his left eye was given to him by an older Obi-Wan when he attempted to kill the Jedi. For those of you thinking about Jango and Boba, we all know who Jango and Boba Fett are, and I feel like in order for me to do them justice I would have to devote an entire video to them. I feel like overall the bounty hunters have this undeserved reputation as being pure evil, Yes, at times their moral compass can be a bit shaky, but they essentially work for the highest bidder. If you have enough credits, then there's a good chance you have the bounty hunters on your side. Another reason we don't often see them on the side of the Republic might have something to do with the Republic and the Jedi specifically disagreeing with the bounty hunters' approach of whatever it takes to get the job done. You can definitely make the argument that most of their actions, be it assassinations or kidnappings, make them inherently evil. I'd argue that quite often their actions are driven by monetary gain and not enjoyment. 
Most bounty hunters are probably desensitized and see everything as a job. That being said, there are almost definitely some unsavory and evil individuals who see bounty hunting as the perfect job. I guess the reason I like the bounty hunters is because they add another dynamic to the conflict between the Empire and the Republic. They act almost like a tool or a weapon, available for both sides to use if they desire. I hope you guys enjoyed today's video, it's been a while since we've made any Star Wars content and this was the first video voted on by the patrons, so I hope you guys enjoyed it. If you did then let me know what you thought in the comments below, but as always, I've been your host, Mythology and Fiction Explained.